come with soft focus as we explore the parapets. The coast of Britain is littered with castles and keeps. No one knows what they were made for. Some say it was a fear of sea animals. Some say they were built because people were bored. Others say it was a great public arts project made by a socialistic government. We will just never know. What we do know is that they buried their pets in the ground outside with loving tenderness. Beagles, mice, hamsters, and guinea pigs alike were interred with great pomp and circumstance in tombs festooned with glyphs and gold ingots. Centuries have passed since the castles were put to practical use, but now Soft Focus insists that the old fireplaces be fired up, the hay on the floor freshened, and the portcullis lifted in order that we conduct an interview with one of the most bewitching musicians of our time, Jay Maskus of Dinosaur Jr., Deep Wound, Witch, Jay Maskus and Friends, and The Fog. I can't wait to speak with him. Buffet. <laughs> yeah, no, that's what we had yesterday. It's pretty gross. You know that all the meat chips here are vegetarian? Oh. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So this is nice, I think. I didn't know there was an audience involved. Yeah, nobody, uh, <laughs> nobody told me either. No. No, uh, yeah, somebody was supposed to tell you. Yeah. Next time I'll take control. Right. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming to talk to us. Um, sure. Pe people talk about about rock and roll as this kind of degenerate, uh, nihilistic thing, but <laughs> I think in rock and roll there's just as strong, uh, uh, like a monastic kind of impulse, you know, like self-sacrifice. Right. I don't know. I know that you were straight edge when you were a kid. Yeah. And I know, like, the Boston scene was really straight edge, or it was really... SSD. Yeah, but I was like, it's cool because I, I was kind of came to, you know, straight edge kind of on my own and just, you're just like, I was into punk and all the punk seemed like, oh, they're all junkies and all this stuff. And then, you know, you find Minor Threat single comes out and you're like, wow, dude, this is way more relatable because my town was full of hippies and like the way to rebel was kind of not to do drugs. I was just so sick of all these acid burnouts around town. And, so yeah, I was already like, that's where I was at, totally. Like, I just couldn't take it anymore, and I just hated drugs and all the druggy hippies and stuff. And <laughs> so when that came out, I was like, wow, these, this is way more relatable to me than like junky yeah. New York Dolls kind of punk. And yeah, stuff. yeah. Because that's, you know, exactly where I was at in that moment, so that was pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, well, so I... So you were so you were going to see all these bands in Boston in the that that era. Yeah, and that's um. It was convenient because it was I was two hours away from Boston, but all the shows were right next to the bus station, so you could take the bus and it would drop you off, and it was this art gallery next to the bus stop, and then go back to the bus and go back to Amherst. So were you going to the the Rat or the Channel, or were you going it was to called just all the Gallery days? East? It was most of the shows were. Mm. Like, you know, like negative approach I saw there and minor thread and yeah. gang so green cool. and stuff. Yeah. Well, Boston is, I don't know if people here probably don't know this, and maybe people in America don't know it, but it's kind of a L.A. East. It's like a real music industry town in, in a way. Like so many of the bands that break, you know, in a kind of more college you know, on the a substrata, or I'll come from Boston. Oh, yeah. And what do you think of that? I always related more to New York or had better luck in New York because that's three hours for me and Boston was two hours. And oh, yeah, yeah. We always kind of felt more accepted in New York and stuff, so I'd always kind of go down there, not after hardcore kind of ended and we were just kind of starting Dinosaur and trying to 
you know, it was weird starting a band after hardcore. You know, we tried to play at a hardcore show, but we weren't really hardcore anymore, and everyone hated us. So I was like, oh, we have no fans anywhere. So kind yeah. of New York was the first place we kind of yeah. got some sympathetic ears, I guess. Who were who who the sympathetic ears? Those well, people. Just, yeah, you know, like our first gig, we opened for Big Black, Maxwell's, and like Sonic Youth was there and some other people, that, you know, they just seemed to be, you know, more interested in us. Like in our hometown, we got banned from every club pretty much immediately for being too loud and too, if you're too loud and you don't have any fans, it's a bad combination. <laughs> um, you're from, uh, you're from Amherst. Are you from Amherst? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a cartoon that used to be popular in the United States called Scooby-Doo. And uh, there were five <laughs> principal characters, and each, each of the five represented one of the colleges in Amherst. Oh, wow. I yeah. never heard about that. Yeah, yeah like da- uh, Daphne was uh, Mount Holyoke. <laughs> and, uh, exactly. and then the, the uh, Scooby is Hampshire. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> What's the, I, I, yeah, the, the other girl is um, Thelma. She must be Smith. She's Smith. Oh, yeah. Thelma's Smith, and then uh, what's the, the dude is. Um, he must be UMass, like. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, no, no. Uh, no, the dog is. Uh, is UMass? Is UMass. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> No, sh- I'm sorry, Shaggy. Shaggy. Shaggy is Hampshire. Yeah, that's Shaggy. Yeah, Shaggy's Hampshire. But so the what's other the guy Jack is Amherst. Guy? Oh yeah, Amherst. Yeah. That's the preppy kind of the preppy yeah. guy. Yeah. So do you? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> I mean, yeah, each college has its own. Like Hampshire is the hippie college with no grades. That a lot of like rich kids would go to their parents couldn't deal with them but they wanted them to be in college but since they don't have grades it seems they can kind of float there for a while and be fuck ups and they have a you have somebody that you can write your own uh, yeah, major your own major you can frisbee. A guy, yeah a guy graduated with a frisbee degree yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but he did get his own model from whammo so he was pretty good i also know that you know, we're, we're in uh, the united kingdom right now right <laughs> which is um, which is the home of oi, oi music. Oh, yeah. And I know you have an affection for this kind of special, special yeah. East End, the sound of the streets, the East End, <laughs> oi. Yeah, I mean, yeah, in my town, it was so obscure, like, you know, there's like two people maybe buying records and you get Sound. I got this Sounds magazine that said Punk's Not Dead and Wadi was on the cover and it had like the 100 best punk singles or something. So I was like, I tried to collect all those. And it had so out of context, you know, like you have no idea what it means at either like Exploited or Screwdriver. Or it's just this record and if it's good, you like it and if it's... yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of that music was at the time. A lot of people condemned it as uh, like bubblegum, like a kind of bubblegum yeah. version of punk. But there's some good tunes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you got the Stooges back together. Yeah, I guess I helped along the way. How did that happen? Um, I was playing with Mike Watt in the Fog and. Uh, I had met um, Ron Ashton with Mike when he was doing Wild Rats, like recording in New York. And we were playing in Ann Arbor and I knew Watt, knew Ron and I was like, and Watt always likes to play Stooges songs anyway. So we, like I've played whole sets of Stooges songs with Watt before that anyway. And uh, so we just, you know, said Watt, you know, why don't we call Ron and get him down and do some, see if he wants to do some tunes. And yeah, he did like, I don't know, five songs. And then, you know, we just kind of kept getting him to come out to different shows. And then we got him on a few tours. And then 
at an ATP in um, LA. Thurston wanted um, us to play Stooges songs, and then we actually got, and Ron wanted to get, you know, his brother, Rock Action, to play. So then we start, then we played um, with me and Watt and Ron and Scott Ashton. Had different people sing. It was pretty cool. We did that a few times, and then I guess Iggy heard about it. I was getting pissed because everybody liked it better than his solo band, I guess. <laughs> and so then he called up Ron and got it going again. That's the way to do it. That's cool. So um, I wanted to talk to you about um, television. Just uh, TV as, you know, there, there used to be a cultural theorist from Canada called uh, Marshall McLuhan. And he talked a lot about television as a kind of um, a medium that was more interactive than other, you know, media. Like more than film, for example, because it's just on. And yeah. Things are, you can, you're kind of, it's just a thing that's happening in the room, but you're actually carrying on. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I always kind of like TV better than uh, movies and stuff, I don't know. Yeah. I like that, I just like the quantity, I guess. I just like, like I liked soap operas as a kid too. I thought it was amazing that they'd be on every day and guys would actually grow old in real time on TV yeah. on every day. And I would always wonder why they'd always be pissed being in a soap and want to be a movie star. I kind of thought soaps was you know, the audience is so loyal, I don't, I didn't see why that was worse than being in the yeah. movies or something. I was yeah. Just, like, I'd get pissed when they'd all, like, leave and, and fail as movie stars and then try to come back to soaps. And, uh -huh. Yeah. And I mean, I, yeah, I grew up with the TV on all the time. It was just on in the house in the background. And, you know, we pay attention to it now and again. Or, yeah. But... Do you see it as like a med? Is it like meditative, like something that allows you to focus? I, I don't know because guitar players, typically, they you know there has to be something to allow you to practice guitar. Yeah, I I have to watch TV and write songs because I don't. Know, I think it takes so you don't have to count. You know, because writing songs is kind of like fishing or something. You're just waiting for something to happen and. You kind of have to do something while you're waiting for... Yeah, yeah. You know, if you try to concentrate too hard, and you, you, it's hard to write a song, but if you're just watching TV and playing and not worrying about it, and then just wait for something to come to you. I know that your... Um, your house burned down. Mm. I'm sorry about that. Oh, it's I know it happened a while ago. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah how did that happen? Um... This guy who cleaned the chimney um, just did a bad job, I guess. And then, uh, yeah, the chimney caught on fire. And it's pretty strange, yeah, to, to be in the fire because I didn't really realize at first, like, alarms going off, you know, the smoke alarm. Because it was in the basement and I was on the first floor and I was kind of like, and the stove's going and you're just kind of like, Oh, why is that going off? And you try to turn off the smoke alarm first. And yeah. Then you realize it's still going off. And then I just open the door to the basement, and there's just like all the smoke coming up, and just close the door. And like, oh shit, something's going on. You know. Did you, but you, did you lose a lot of stuff or? Uh, yeah. But yeah, nothing that. I mean, there's always more stuff. That's what, you know, you come away from sure. not going here. And I didn't lose any, like, Discord seven inches or anything. Like, like Gerard. Or <laughs> well, that's good. So James Brown started as a drummer. Yeah. In fact, a lot of singers, a lot of front people of groups start as Iggy. drummers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Iggy started as a drummer, yeah. How, how do you think it changes your perspective as a songwriter, singer? 
Uh, well, songwriting, like I hear the drums as part of the song, and so there's not much room for any kind of uh, input on drums. Like people don't understand that sometimes. They're like, yeah, they, you know, like bass. I don't hear bass, so I don't care what goes, you know, what you yeah. play or something. But the drums I hear, so you can't. It's really specific. It's part of the song, so oh, yeah. there's no room for any uh, improvisation or yeah. any ideas from a drummer or anything. It's like, <laughs> yeah. which and you know, a lot of people don't understand that they don't hear drums as part of the song. They just kind of have a beat and play the song. Too. Yeah, it's probably a lot of, yeah, a lot of music. Yeah, that's it's almost like disrespectful of the drums. The idea that or just do whatever yeah. you want. Yeah, just. But bass, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't hear bass, really, so yeah. I don't care what happens. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Dinosaur Jr. has recently played with the uh, original lineup, or not recently, but, you know, you know has yeah. been recently. And, um, and, and there's this kind of like a... Well, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, do you think people are being... Do you think, why is there this fixation on, you've been making music perpetually, mm -hmm. but there's this kind of fixation on, uh, you know, something being recreated as, as it was at one point or something. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, for me it was kind of like, uh, yeah, with Dinosaur, you know, we kind of grew up and learned to play together and have a certain sound and a certain energy. And then you realize for better or worse, you know, it's kind of a rare thing and, you know, that doesn't come along that much. So, you know, just despite, you know, not getting along or something, we can realize that we have something special and and there's so many crappy bands out there now, and so many bands that it's easy to look good in that context, because if you have anything special at all, it's kind of like, seems yeah. amazing, just compared to <laughs> a zillion other bands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's really about the, yeah, the chemistry. Mm -hmm. how, how did you guys, um, how did you guys meet? Well, Murph, I met in school. He was just uh, the guy with the car. We smoke pot all the time. And, but Lou, I was in you know, a deep wound with. We met through, there's this one record store in Northampton near my, uh, oh, excuse. There's a record store um, in Northampton, which is next to Amherst, which had punk records. And one week I saw this kid who looked like Dee Dee Ramone and he was looking kind of at the same records like anti and Discharge and stuff and I started talking to him and then the next week there was a flyer up, you know, drummer wanted, you know, Discharge, anti -posty. Yeah. I knew it must have been that kid and I called him and uh, he'd been playing with Lou. They were in a town 45 minutes away from Amherst and uh, so then we just started playing together and I met Lou at his, yeah, I went to his house to jam with those guys and that's when I met him. Cool. And I always thought it was strange, like he wouldn't really talk, but anything he would say, I could, I could find in a fanzine laying around his room, like <laughs> any sentences he said, I was like, I saw that in the fanzine he just had. What kind of fanzine? Like Force Exposure or something? Yeah, like Sick Teen. And yeah. Who was he? Maybe was he quoting Byron Coley or? Or Narby Ugly or just any. Tesco B. Yeah. <laughs> Those guys were pretty vulgar, those writers. Oh, yeah. So was he saying vulgar things? No, no. Just kind of like. Can't even remember. Four just... stars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just want to thank you for coming to talk to me. Yeah, sure. I really enjoyed it, actually. Cool. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>